for lectures, we're going to return to the study of black holes. Um, and we're going to look at black holes in a, in a little more detail in, in, in many ways. Mm. We'll try to eventually end a session on black holes with uh, uh, trying to understand you know, things like two black hole systems and so on. But at the moment, we're interested in uh, um, simpler, more elementary properties, uh, or more, more formal properties of black holes. OK, so let, 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 let's start. Let's first uh, remember, uh, as all of you know, black holes are not just solutions of general relativity. They are astrophysical objects. And that's, of course, a very important property of black holes. Um, and uh, black ho nobody really knows if there's, there's another way of the if astrophysical black holes were also formed by collapse of, let's say, dark matter bubbles or something like that in the very early universe. That's not really known. But certainly one way that black holes form is by collapse of stars. Okay? Um, so let's um, at least very briefly remember, remember how that goes. OK, so, uh, so to understand that, the first question we're going to ask is, what is, how is a star like the sun in equilibrium? You know, what, what is the force balance that keeps the sun in equilibrium? OK, so we've got something like the sun here. OK, it's got a lot of mass. The mass has some gravitational pull. That's trying to push everything to the center. What's keeping, what's, what's keeping it from collapsing? OK, let's do this analysis quickly and crudely in Newtonian gravity, hmm? just to get a sense for what's going on. OK, so imagine that, we, that the sun is made up of some fluid. OK, and the fluid has some energy density, which is a function of R, and a pressure, which is a function of R. Since we know the energy density as a function of R, we can compute the net in energy is mass density, is Newton. So, so a rho, okay. Just the, the net amount of mass. Okay? Per uh, uh, right. This would become like the T00 part of the stress tensor in general gravity. But okay. Um, now let's compute the net mass comp uh, contained in inside a sphere of radius r. Okay, so all of you know how to do that. It's 4 pi r squared rho of r integral dr 0 to r is equal to m of r. That's the net mass contained inside this. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is Take so everything we assume is spherically symmetric, and uh, we've got let's say some sh a shell of stuff that go that lies between R and R plus delta. Okay, and uh, I want to understand what the force balance on you know a little little bit of this shell is. This little bit of the shell has some solid angular delta omega. Uh, uh, yeah, extend some solid angle delta omega. Okay. Okay. So, firstly, let us remember: suppose there was no gravity. Okay. If there was no gravity, then a ball of fluid at constant pressure is in equilibrium. Okay. So that tells you that the forces on this little fluid element from a constant pressure will cancel each other out. Okay, we could work out how that happens. You know, that would be. Uh, I'm I'm going to pretend pretend we're in one plus one dimen uh, two di two dimensional space just as, so you can see that more. more. You can see roughly how that's going to happen. Um, you might at first confuse yourself into thinking that. Well, if I took a little area element like this, uh, I would get some pressure like that. 
and some pressure like that. The pressures are equal, but this looks like it's going over a, a larger length. So my, you might confuse yourself into thinking that there was a net downward push. But you know, there's also this, the, the stuff from these ends that gives you a net upward push. And uh, we could work it out, but we know beforehand that these things will cancel each other out. It's clearly pre constant pressure is at equilibrium. Okay? So, um, any force due to pressure necessarily involves derivatives of pressure. Because the constant pressure thing must be in equilibrium. Okay? And therefore, we can very quickly, so the, uh, we're just looking at the forces in the radial direction. So, suppose we have some, we have this P of R function, so P is uh, it's like this. Uh, on this little solid angle element, there is B omega uh, times R squared, that's the area, times BP by dr times delta R. That will be the net force on this little area element. Okay? I've not been careful about whether I take R squared, R plus delta R squared, because that's the part that's going to cancel out into the side stuff. Right? That there would have been this, this other part from those differences, and then the other part from the side, that was all independent of the derivative of the pressure. Okay? And even uh, when you integrate it around, does the two I mean, that would cancel out. Uh, uh, that's a very confusing thing to do because forces are in different directions. Uh -huh. You know, so uh, there's a sense in which perhaps you could do that, but there's another way to do it, which is just write down the conservation of the stress tensor. Del, write down the stress tensor field and use the fact that del i p i j is equal to f j. f j is like the force density. Okay, that, that would be a sophisticated way to do this. Anyway, anyway, we don't want to spend too much time. This is clear, right? Okay, so this is the net force on this little element due to pressure differentials. Okay. So, on the other hand, uh, there is some force due to gravity. So, what is the force due to gravity? Um, so, so, let's see. Firstly, if the pressure is, um, if dp by dr is positive, then this force would be inward. So let's count, let's count forces in the inward direction. There's another inward force due to gravity. Okay, so that's G M of R times rho of R times the volume of that element times delta R times delta omega uh, divided by R. This has to be equal to zero. That's force balance. This is the kind of thing. Yeah. The kind of thing you, you, know, you could have been given in the TI for instance. Right. Oh. That's fair. Thank you. No, I mean, that's fair. I'm saying I want R below and I want R for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think the answer is R. Well, there's an R squared downstairs, firstly, because Newton's law has an R squared. And R there is an R squared. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. R squared. OK. So now let's cancel things that are common. Firstly, of course, all the infinitesimals cancel. Mm. Uh, and then, so we get an equation which is dp by dr. Um, is equal to minus g, uh, so this r square, this r square cancel, g m of r, rho of r, um, divided by r square. Now, this looks like one equation 
for two variables. The two variables being rho or equivalent to m if you know one, you know the other. Let's say m is your variable, then rho is related to m prime. So it looks like one equation for two variables. So you can think of this rho as essentially m prime with the right factors. Okay? Uh, and of course, in order to make this one equation for one variable, what you would need is an equation of state. Equation of state. Um, so an equation of state would be something that tells you what the pressure is in terms of the energy density for this. Okay? So you could use a perfect. You know, th that depends on detailed chemistry now. Yeah, it depends on the detailed the uh, dynamics of the stuff that makes up the substance. We leave that. Yeah, we leave that schematically. Uh, we won't try to solve this much further. Uh, once you put in an equation of state, it's clear that integrating this equation, you can find the pressure as a function of R and the mass as a function of R. Okay, there's maybe hard. You may have to do some work to solve the equation, but clearly you can. I can do it. Okay, so these are the equations that govern the equilibrium of something like the sun. Now. I want to just take some order of mag magnitude estimates away from this calculation. Okay. Um, and the orders of magnitude that I want to take away are as follows. Suppose that the net mass of the sun, <laughs> I suppose that the net mass of the sun is n mass, of the, of the star that, uh, that is in question, I, is n. Okay. So rho of r will be very crudely, rho will be of order m by r cube. Maybe 10 times it, or 1 tenth of it at some point, but roughly. So, delta p, okay, and this we'll also estimate as, uh, estimate as some, p let p naught be some rough measure of the typical pressure inside, inside the star. Uh, we'll estimate dp by dr by p naught by r. Okay, so we get p naught divided by r is order of magnitude. Okay, uh, g m squared by r to the four. R to the five. Thank you. Hmm. R to the five. Okay. Um, so R to the four, and maybe the way we want to think of this is that P naught times R square is of order G M squared by R square. Okay, this is like from Newton's law, some estimate of the rough gravitational force involved, and this is a rough estimate of pressure forces involved. To get a force from pressure, you need to multiply pressure by an area. Okay? So this we could have said without doing anything so sophisticated. In equilibrium, a star is in equilibrium because it pressure balances gravity. That's the key point. And this rough order of magnitude estimate tells you, gives you a s sense of the scales involved. Okay, so if you've got a, star, a star of extent r, then the pressures involved inside will be roughly gm, you know, will be roughly given by this equation. Okay, great. Now, the way the sun is actually in equilibrium is because it's hot. Right, the, 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 the sun's in equilibrium because it's hot. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, that heat allows it to generate a lot of pressure. As you know, as stars get hotter, uh, as gases get hotter and hotter and hotter, the pressures get higher and higher and higher. And so, uh, well, uh, one can sort of crudely, from knowing the mass of the sun, estimate the pressure using, let's say, an ideal gas relationship, uh, and then from that estimate the temperature, you get some very high temperature. It's the heat of the sun that keeps it in equilibrium. Okay. Now this, class, uh, you know, this gives a, uh, leads to the following question. The question that leads to is, well, where does the heat of the sun come from? 
as you know, it comes from fusion. Fusion is the process of hydrogen turning into helium. But at some point, even if it takes very long, this fusion, the hydrogen will all get used up. So what happens after the hydrogen gets fused? Well, actually what happens is complicated. Sometimes some parts of the helium can fuse and some, com some complicated set of sequences uh, where it can happen. But the basic principle is the same. At some point, all the fuel that you can use to generate heat will get used up. Then what happens? Okay. Either there's some other source of pressure that will balance this down, or it will start to collapse. Okay. Now, this new source of pressure, whatever it is, cannot depend on, on there being heat. Because we're looking at what happens once the heat has all gone away. So, you know, fusion has stopped, the sun has less lost all its heat by radiation, it's now cooled down. So what, what, what could the source of pressure be? And until the beginning of the last, until quantum mechanics, nobody had a suggestion for what the source of this pressure could be. Okay? But quantum mechanics gives us an idea for what it might be. Okay? Uh, quantum mechanics gives us an idea for what it might be. And we're going to now try to uh, sort of understand it. Okay. So let us remember about, let us remind ourselves about the physics of um, a gas of fermions, free fermions, um, to start with the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We'll soon look at it in the relativistic theory as well. But to start with the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay. So imagine we've got a gas of three electrons. So our fermions have a certain mass, m. They may or may not be charged. That's going to be irrelevant to our considerations. They're basic. They're just free. Okay. The non-relativistic. So uh, the energy is given by p squared by two m. Okay. Let's say I've got a box of volume v. I've got some box of volume v. And in this, um, in this box of volume V, I put n of these electrons. The question I'm going to ask is what is the ground state, the minimum energy of the system? I'm interested in ground state because we're interested in systems that are zero temperature, once all thermal effects have gone away. Okay, so what is the ground state? Uh, uh, what is the ground state energy of the system? Well, that's very easy. It's given. Uh, uh, you know, if this was a gas of bosons, that would be very, uh, very, very extremely easy. You see, because bosons have the property that they can all be in the same state. So each of the bosons would pick out the lowest energy state available for the bo uh, for for the thing to be in. It would have, a, depending exactly the boundary conditions in your box. Let's say it would have energy 1 by r. And then you would have n of these bosons. So it would have energy n by r. It would be very simple. OK? But fermions are more complicated. Uh, fermions are more complicated because of the Fermi exclusion rule. You cannot have more than, you cannot have, let's, let's say the spinless case. Factors of 2 are not going to play a role. Uh, uh, you cannot have more than one electron in any given energy state. Okay, So now what I want to do is to estimate the ground state energy of the system. Okay, So now we've got the first question we're going, to, we're going to have to ask is how many free particle states are there? How many free particle states are there for the electron between, uh, for the electron, um, uh, for the electron lying between momentum p and p plus delta p. Okay, now there's this. Of course, for any given shape of the box, we can just do an exact calculation. 
but there is this beautiful WKB style formula for the volume in phase space, which tells you that um, the number of states is d 3 x d 3 k divided by 2 pi the whole thing cube. In our, in our problem we are not d 3 x is just volume. So, it is just a v divided by uh, v times d 3 k divided by 2 pi cube, where k is the wave vector of the uh, of the wave uh, of the wave function of the of your particle e to the pi k dot x. So, if you have got three particles behaving like e to the pi k dot x that is what k is. But k as all of you know is what is it p by k is equal to p by m. H bar, yeah. Uh, H bar, okay, how, how does it go? Wait. I H bar del by del x is equal to p. Ah, so there's not even an m. Just p. Thank you. H, H bar k, exactly. H bar k. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so H bar k is equal to p. And so we can write this as v d3p divided by 2 pi cube by h bar cube. This is the number of states of for uh, of electrons. What? Uh, the number of states of electrons whose momentum lies between a yeah uh, in in a little mo uh, little volume in momentum space whose volume element is d3p. Okay. So, now let us ask how many states are there for the electrons, okay, for the electrons in a shell in momentum space, whose mag such that the magnitude of momentum lies between p and p plus delta p. Exactly. So, we, we are looking at p and p plus delta p. So, then we just need to estimate uh, to calculate the va volume of the shell in momentum space, but as uh, it was pointed out that we know so that 4 pi p squared delta p. Okay. So, number of states, so, <coughs> so the number of states uh, that lies between p and delta p, uh, p let us call that n, n of p. Um, Is this clear? Now we are going to ask what is the energy? Now the, the idea is that at zero temperature m first the first electron will occupy the lowest energy state. The next electron will uh, occupy the second lowest energy state and so on. So in momentum space what will be occupied will be a shell of momenta that is a ball in momentum space. Because as you go to higher and higher ma uh, magnitude of momenta, the energies of the states become larger and larger. Okay, so the, the first case is also better. Yeah, then the, this shell is also better. And so, so I want to ask, what is the energy of all the states that lie between p and delta p, whose ma um, whose ma uh, such that the momenta of these states, the mag magnitude of the momenta lie between p and delta p. Okay. The energy is just the number of such uh, such states times the energy of each state. Okay. The reason that we looked at shells rather than more finely is that all states in the same shell have the same energy. Okay. So if we write uh, E of p, the energy per unit ma magnitude of p, that's just n of p times p squared by 2m. Okay. So that is v times 4 pi p squared times p squared by 2m times delta p divided by 2 pi the whole thing cube h bar cube. Okay, now let us be less cumbersome and sim simplify some of these things. So, okay, so we have got v 
we've got p to the 4. Um, not that we really need them, but okay, let's carry, since we've calculated them, let's carry the pi's around. Um, so there's an 8 here, there's a 4, um, so overall there's a 4, right? <laughs> we, we could. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. But H bar keeps I, H bar appears in more places than H, so <laughs> it's a nicer value. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so if I calculated that right, uh, I got this. And now if I want to calculate the net energy, okay? Now I want to calculate two things. First I want to calculate the net number of electrons. So suppose that the maximum energy is some Pf, uh, maximum P is some Pf, okay? So let me compute the net number of electrons. I do that by integrating this formula. I'll also simplify this formula. It's sort of a bit of a pain, but okay. N of P is equal to uh, N of P was equal to, of course, what's important, really important is the P square. Um, two pi square, oh, sorry, two pi square V H bar cube delta P. Okay, so let's start by integrating uh, the total number up to Pf. Okay, so that we just integrate that. So n is equal to v by 6 pi squared h bar cube times Pf cube. And the net energy. of our system is equal to good v by 20 pi square h bar cube m m pf 5 uh, to, to the to the 5 is that okay Okay, and then this Pf, of course, is, an is some variable in our head. It's not part of the physics. What we care about is what is the energy as a function of the number of fermions. So we want to eliminate this, this Pf between these two things. So we exactly. So we use this to solve. So Pf is equal to six pi squared h bar cube n by v to the power one third. And so we get E is equal to uh, is equal to V by 20 pi squared. And then 6 pi squared h bar cube n by 20 pi squared h bar cube m. Uh, V to the power five by three. Okay. Now, let us imagine that our box is a spherical box. Okay, so that this V is whatever it is. What is it? Four by three. Pi r cube. Okay. 
So we'll substitute this by 4 by 3 pi r cube. Is this uh, uh, simply eliminate uh, v from there? You, you want to simplify it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that, that we will. We'll just 4 by 3 pi r cube. Uh, okay. And then we can kill ourselves by keeping track of all the pi's. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to do that if you'd like to. I'll just keep track now of, uh, uh, of the parametric dependences. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, let's, let's, let's keep track of h bar first. So this says this was h bar to the power 5 divided by h bar cube. So it's h bar square. Then uh, let's, the really important ones are the, OK, let's, the m was simple because it was just by m. Um, then there is n um, to the power 5 by 3. And here, this became r to the power 5. And there was r q, yeah, by r square. And we, we should have one formula also, which had E by itself, uh, uh, with the volume. I'll also write E yeah. with volume. Yeah, we need E. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, so to get volume, we just replace this by R cube with V. Uh, so uh, so uh, E was this. E was also in terms of volume. The parameter H bar squared by M n to the power 5 by 3, v to the power 2 by 3. OK. Now the pressure on the walls of a box <laughs> is the derivative of the energy with respect to the volume. Okay, so we want to estimate the pressure of this, this gas, this gas, the zero temperature gas of Fermi. Okay, uh, we want to estimate that. I'm not going to keep track of the pi's and so on. Uh, you could do that, but it's not needed to make the point. So, uh, so the pressure, so that will become now fi uh, uh, five by three goes like h bar squared by m um, n to the power 5 by 3 divided by v to the power 5 by 3. Is this clear? And now it's most useful now to substitute this in terms of r. So that's h bar squared by m, n to the 5 by 3 divided by r to the power 5. OK. So suppose we had our star made up of n of these particles. Okay, Each of the particles has rest, rest mass, let's say m. So let's continue to imagine some other algebraic formula. Okay? So what is the net mass? The mass of our star is simply n times m. Okay? And now we can do our rough. Uh, you remember we concluded that in order for equilibrium to happen, we need P R squared is equal to G M squared by R squared. 
Okay? So we need PR squared is equal to GM squared by R squared. And uh, so we can substitute. Okay. So let's substitute this in terms of N. So that's N squared M squared. And let's substitute this here in terms of all of this. So this is h bar squared by m, n to the 5 by 3 divided by r to the power 5 by 3. Five. r to the power 5, thank you. So we cancel the r squared, so that's 1 by r cube. Okay, so the left hand side is a measure of the forces due to pressure. The right hand side is, side is a measure of the forces due to gravity when the star is of size r. Okay, so first question we ask is when, well, suppose, the star, suppose r was very, very big, which one wins? And of course, this one wins because r squared falls off less fast than r cubed. So if it's very, very big, Gravity will pull it in. That's clear, right? You know, the pressure is degeneracy pressure. It's a consequence. It's of electrons resisting being pushed too near to each other. They don't like to be in the same place. And they can only be in the same place if they go to higher and higher energies. Right? So if it's very, very big, there's no very little pressure. There's also very little gravity, but the point is that this scales like 1 by r cube. Well, this scales like 1 by r squared. Okay? On the other hand, when r is very, very small, this guy wins. So there is some r in between where it will find its equilibrium. Okay? There is some r in between where this thing will find its equilibrium. And this r will be given by r will be of order r. It's order of magnitude, so that is r will be given by uh, h bar squared n to the power um, uh, ra, 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 oh, minus 1 by 3, right? Um, divided by g um, m cube. Did I get that right? Okay, so roughly at this value of r, the star will stay in equilibrium. So you might think, well, that's great. Nature is so constituted, so, to, so as to have a natural safety valve. When uh, the sun runs out of, eh, of, uh, uh, out of energy, um, it'll stuff will maybe collapse a little bit, but at some value of r, that collapse would be stabilized, not by thermal pressure, but by intrinsic pressures coming from the nature of fundamental interactions, in particular the nature of uh, the fact that the basic constituents of matter are first laws. Mm -hmm. Okay, this would have been very satisfactory, except that we assumed that the whole calculation was non-relativistic. Okay, now let us very quickly repeat, repeat this calculation for relativistic fermions and see if anything qualitative changes. No, no, not, not at all, not at all. Not so, I mean, uh, but we still have G, H, and C together. We have G, H, and C together. Uh, yes. So you, 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 you see, what, what's, 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 what's different also is that you have a lot of, you have this very large M. Oh. So you've got, you know, lots. You, it's true that you, well, and the, you will also have an M. It's not that that will completely drop out of the Planck scale. Yeah, so the, uh, the Planck scale is a scale formed only out of G, G H bar. 
Uh, we, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Okay. So let us very quickly repeat this uh, um, repeat the story in the realistic. Okay. So the first question is how many states were there between P and delta P? How is that different in the relativistic case? So the dispersion is shown as V equals T. Right. But how many, the question at the moment is how many states are there? That just does not change. Yeah, that doesn't mean that Because that's just a matter of phase space. It's a matter of counting. Yeah. Counting how. It's Fourier, uh, this statement about Fourier modes. Fourier modes are the same. Fourier modes are Fourier modes. Okay. So if somebody helps me get that, that N of N of P, let's write it again. Somebody, somebody's written it down. Uh, let's do the differential form first. Okay. Fine. So this is unchanged. What has changed is what Upman you said. Uh, what has changed is uh, the formula for what the energy is as a function of p. So what is e of p? This is equal to square root of uh, p squared plus m squared. Square root of p squared plus m squared. Um, square root of p squared plus m squared times uh, v p squared by 2 pi squared h bar cube delta p. Now everything is going to be pretty complicated if we keep these square roots around. So let's, we worked in the very non-relativistic limit, let's work in the opposite limit first. Let's work in the ultra-relativistic limit. Okay, let's work in the limit where most of the shell is so relativistic that we can ignore the n. Okay. Um, in this case, um, in this case, this is equal to p divided by two pi squared h bar cube v p uh, p squared p cube, and I should keep a c around in my. And now we just integrate both these formulas. Okay. So n is integrated as before, so we get n was equal to v p f cube. Okay, and I'm dropping, I'll just keep parametric dependence by h bar. Okay, but e now is significantly different because instead of being p f to the 5, it's p f to the 4. Is this clear? E is equal to V P F to the 4 by H bar cube. And there's no 1 by M. OK. So now what we have, now we want to eliminate uh, we want to eliminate pf between these. And so we get, uh, we want e as a function of v and n. So we will get e is equal to, now uh, how is it? This will give us a v to the power 1 by 3, to uh, 1 by 3, 4 by 3, so 1. Uh, 1 by v to the power 1 by 3 and an n to the 1 by 3 is an n to the power 4 by 3. And what about h bars? One, uh, p, uh, so the pf was h bar 
uh, right, one h bar. Is this clear? Great. And therefore, the pressure is of order n to the 4 by 3 divided by v to the 4 by 3 uh, by h bar. The times. And so, now we want to repeat this balance. What we have to do, so this is like n to the power 4 by 3, h bar divided by r to the power 4. So p r squared is sort of like n to the 4 by 3, um, n to the 4 by 3 h bar by R square. On the other hand, this m here, uh, it's a bit harder to say what uh, uh, what we should estimate that. Uh, harder to say what we should estimate that. Uh, we should maybe have done it more carefully. Yes. Mm. Let me just treat this as a limiting. Okay. You see, in, in order to do this more carefully, I should do the whole thing more carefully. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm worked on relativistically, Newtonian potential and so on. I'm just going to continue to estimate this by n m squared g by r squared. Uh, clearly, this r squared here should be thought of as something, some function of r that interpolates between two ends. Okay? So this pressure here is some function that interpolates between this quantity and this quantity, depending on how non, how relativistic the gas is becoming. So, I mean, the exponent would be something like one over r to the sig uh, sigma. Or like right, right. It it will be some some complicated thing in the middle. This Jepson thing is um, still only taking the rest mass and not the total energy. Uh, th this exactly. So, uh, so that's that's right. So it's true that eventually we should correct this as well, this mass. Okay, it's true that we should eventually correct it. Let me not try to do that accurately. Say, say we're at the edge between relativistic and non-relativistic. It'll be a factor correction. Okay. Uh, in linear model, also the effect is only from the rest mass. What? Take ultra relativistic limit. No. Yeah. So uh, you know that's what I'm saying. Where I've got this, it would not be right. Just think of think of this pressure formula. This pressure formula is something that interpolates between this and that. Okay, and I'm on the right hand side. I'm going to give you the mass formula, which is only really correct where I'm almost non-relativistic. Okay, to do this properly, what I should do is to take everything non-relativistic into account. So everything relativistic in account, including general relativity. Okay, that that is a complicated job to do. I'm not going to try to do it. Okay, what's important to keep in mind is basically this point: that this r squared here and this r squared are the same. Okay, for this reason, for this reason. You see, it's not 
So what, what's going to happen? You see, let's imagine that the, the, the gas was very sparse. Then it would be effectively non-relativistic. Okay? This formula would be correct. Gravity would win and would push it in. Okay? However, it might be that at some point, actually this would happen right at the core where the pressure is becoming sort of maximum. It might be that at some point where this would like to equilibrate, maybe just before it would like to equilibrate. Okay? Part of the uh, fermion fluid becomes non uh, bec starts becoming effectively relativistic. <coughs> okay? At that point, suddenly the fact that this pressure okay, rises faster as a function of compression than the gravitational potential does is no longer true. Okay? And so it's not like you're going to have it's not like you're going to have a particular it's not like it's guaranteed that there will always be some r no matter how small in which the thing will equilibrate. Okay? So now to really study this, we need to do a slightly more serious calculation. We could set up, for instance, actually it's not too, too hard to do. You could set up, for instance, the equations of general relativity with zero temperature fermions, spherically symmetrically distributed as a function of r. Okay? The, dens the proper density of these fermions, spherically symmetrically distributed as a function of r and try to find for equilibrium, search for equilibrium solutions. This estimate suggests, okay, this estimate suggests, and it is true, okay, that it's not, that such an equilibrium need not always exist. Okay, now, when will this equilibrium, when will the existence of such an equilibrium be questionable. Okay, when is this? You see, where this calculation was reliable, the existence of this equilibrium was sort of guaranteed. Okay, so it's the where the validity of this calculation fails. That is the place where the existence of this equilibrium is uh, questionable. Where does the validity of this calculation fail? It fails when Pf is of order the mass of, of the particle. Okay? So now let us back calculate to see what Pf was. So let's take this answer and turn it uh, and use it to, uh, to estimate Pf. Okay? So let's see. So we had this, this quantity here. So we have Pf was of order n by r cube h bhakti to the 1 by c. To the 1 by c. Thank you. So let's put that in here. Okay, so let's put R in there. So R, uh, R cube was, oof. so Pf is of order n h bar, uh, let's just uh, stick to Pf cube. Pf cube is, so Pf cube is of order n h bar cube r cube, so by h bar to the power 6 um, times n times g cube times n to the power 9, something's wrong. Right. 
Um, All right, let's go with this. This doesn't feel right. Uh, uh, that, so that was from the R cube. Sorry, and then I, I had the NH bar cube here. Mm. Okay, so that's n squared by H bar cube G cube n to the power nine. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, we want to see when this is going to be equal to uh, when this is going to be equal to m. So this is m cube is of order n squared g cube n to the ninth by h bar cube or m to the six n squared g cube by Something's something's wrong. Sorry. Sorry. Anyone see any issues with what we did here? Just one minute. Okay. Uh, maybe I should keep track of. Okay, where have I not kept track of C here? I'll, I'll keep keep put in C's and do a dimensional check. Um, yeah, n should be uh, down stationary, right? And the First, I had expected all m's to cancel once I expressed everything in terms of the mass of the. Yeah. Is dimensional, right? Hmm? Is dimensional. No. Capital, capital, n. capital n is dimensionless. But m squared n squared is mass squared. Uh, I, I, let me put in also a c just a minute. So this pf squared yeah. is m cube c cube. M cube c cube exactly. Cube. But uh, from uh, in that R, uh, there would be a, a another factor. Uh Wh in where? No, everything here was non-relativistic. Okay. Oh, the oh yeah, everything over there. So there was no right. more. There were. Hmm. Uh, okay. That's dimensionally totally okay. Uh, well, why, why do I feel it? It's very odd. Just, just one.
well, it's of course clear that the more you have, the larger PS will be. So uh, qualitatively, it's going OK. It's just the power of n. Mm -hmm. Agreeing with what I remember, uh, but, but okay. I'm N was correct, right? We didn't mess, yeah. mess some ends up. Uh, uh, I, I wish Landau Lee should have this calculation because I've checked. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just a minute. Just a minute. Just. Uh, you know what would have made me much happier is if this was an N. Six. Okay, let's let's go with this. I have the strong feeling I've messed up somehow, but let's let's go with this. This would tell you that. Uh, le let's see what it's saying. You see, um, let's replace n by the mass of the star. Uh, within our approximations, um, within our approximations, you see, what's happening here? Uh, go on. I mean, uh, m is uh, the ma uh, so m to this uh, six. You can replace it by m over n, whole to the six. M is the total mass of the star. Uh, star. So that is m over n to the four. Uh, m uh, sorry, m over uh, m to the six, m to the four. And there's the uh, one over m plank to the six. Uh, so uh, I mean m plank to the six m m by m plank uh, to the six is n to the four. Is order n to the four. That's where it becomes starts becoming important. Well, well I, I, the the way I want to think of it is that I've got uh, I want to know I've got a bunch of particles mm. with a little mass m, yes. and I've got the net star of capital mass m. So I want to eliminate n. Yeah, it's okay. So uh, this is telling me that m to the four m squared at least. Uh, okay, so this is what I'm getting. What I'm getting is that if we're if we've got something that's going to be sustained by reliably sustained by non-relativistic um, by non-relativistic uh, 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 th th this is the place where it starts becoming non-relativistic. Uh, I'm sorry, just just one minute. But 
No, the, the, the thing about it is that the uh, physical answer should not depend on time. It's Chandrasekhar limit is more or less the same for electrons and for neutrons. So it, uh, it doesn't change by factor of. And, and just one minute. Okay, uh, let, let me not, let me not, let me not take. I, I'll clear this up next class. Sorry for, sorry for. I, I've done something wrong. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Maybe something. Okay, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you next class what, I, what I've done wrong. Okay, but the the important point here is that there is a mass that is large enough so that it is questionable whether degeneracy pressure will be able to balance it. Okay, There is a mass that is large enough so that it is questionable whether degeneracy pressure will be able to balance it. And uh, uh, I, I, sorry, I will just clear this up. Okay. And I think I am doing something very stupid. That is the right frame. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you next class. I'm sorry about this. Sorry about this. I've messed this up in some stupid way. There is a large, that is a mass that is large enough where it's such that it's questionable whether the gender pressure, pressure will be able to balance the uh, the attraction of the sun. And Uh, and in fact, the answer is that beyond a certain mass, it cannot. I have not given you the right formula for this mass. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So I'll, I'll give you the right, <laughs> the right formula next time and correct whatever wh wh whatever problem I have. <laughs> okay, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, our, our calculation is giving us this, uh, and I'm feeling really stupid about this. But sorry, next class. I'll, 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 I'll Uh, give me one minute, please. What I'm messing up is that we've got this, right? But there's some, some still some range where it's relativistic, where it can be balanced, where that number is larger. It's possible that that's correct. Uh, that's what my mess up is. Uh, it just doesn't feel right because of the m thing. That m is the neutron mass. Well, No, but you know when you do this calculation for electrons, no, when electrons uh, they cannot be. Uh, white dwarfs are sustained by electron pressure. Okay. Okay. So Chandrasekhar originally did the calculation for white dwarfs. for uh, for electrons. Okay. When you do the uh, calculation for neutrons, when you do it really accurately, changes may maybe factor of two. Okay. Doesn't change by a factor of one thousand because. I just certainly messed this up. <laughs> Uh, uh, I embarrassingly enough, I may is am I just applying the wrong criterion? Just, just, just one.
let, let's take 10 minutes more. Do the relativistic case. Let's take 10 minutes, minutes more to do the relativistic case, honestly. And What if, say, say that again, what if, what if? We have one by R cube for pressure in the non-relativistic case. Yes. And one by R square is in the relativistic case, in the relativistic Yes. Case. Yeah, so what, like, and because somewhere the functional form changes from R cube to R square, like what if one by R cube doesn't hold all the way till the limit PF goes through MC? Like, what if there's a change in the functional PF, form? PF goes to, sorry, PF goes to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. Y y it's so unsatisfying to let this be, so we'll take 10 minutes. We'll take, take 10 minutes to try to do it. Do the relativistic case better more systematically and see if we can fix it up. I'm sorry about this, but mm. sorry, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, let's just do it properly. Maybe that's what we did wrong. Let's let's just do the relativistic case, case properly, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and see how. Okay, so I've got this relativistic gas of volume V, and I'm going to on a properly calculate at uh, you know without making some ultra relativistic approximation. I'm going to properly calculate the number density and energy of this thing. So just one question with the gas stuff. Yeah. So in that case, so the energy density should be the kinetic energy or the total energy? Well, the total energy, right? Because cl uh, clearly in the hmm. non -rel the energy density, oh, good. Yeah. You ask. Uh, yeah, uh, because in the non relativistic case, we took the kinetic energy. That was 3 square over 2 a. Well, the pressure. Um, No, well, it should, it's only, the, it's, it's the part that depends on volume. Let, let's do the calculation and, and see if that works. Um. So you are putting in it an in flow, where in is not only here for mass, so there are also protons, so that is a not relativistic. Suppose we were doing neutron, I mean, it, it's only the electron gas that sustains when the elect when you've got electrons and protons. Total mass of the star. Ah. That is that's dominated by neutrons. Uh, that's, uh, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. On the other hand, let's let's suppose we were doing a neutron gas. Uh, then there's only one kind of particle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so total mass will be number of particles, uh, number of electrons into mass of the hydrogen atom. Uh, that's how it would be for. Uh, th that's how it would be provide. Uh, yeah, that would. That's how it would be. Oh. Yeah, I mean the electron mass is negligible compared to the neutron mass. That's it. This is a good point. Maybe this is this is where. This is a good point. This is a good point. This is a good point. Ah, uh, this is a good point. Maybe that's where it ends up. Uh, let, let me check. Thank you. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's it. Sorry. Uh, let mm. Mm. 
let me just redo our estimate for when the, uh, for, for, thank you. Let, let me redo the estimate of including what you, what, what you said and see what we get. So let's see. So let's see. So let's see. So let's see. Uh, so wh what did we have? We have that the pressure mm, So firstly, in our non-relativistic case, we have this balance, right? So we had NMP, as you correctly point out, NMP squared G by R squared uh, was equal to, help me with this side, please. Does somebody remember the non-relativistic non pressure? By M E N to the power five five by three by R cube. Hmm. Okay. So our balance formula R is equal to uh, H bar squared M E M P square um, N to the power minus one by three by G. By G. Right, last time we had said uh, I had stupidly said this was just n cube. For neutrons, it will be n cubed. I, I agree. But let me at least correctly do it for this uh, uh, for 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 the white dwarf case first, uh, wh which is always non-relativistic, uh, which has a place where it's sometimes non-relativistic. Mm. At the end of it, we can say m e equals n cube. It's true. It's, uh, I don't I don't know how it will all fall out, but let's at least correct. Um, okay, so we've got this, this this R here, and then what we did was to take our PF cube. Over there. PF cube thank you. Um, so we took PF cube and replaced it by M E square uh, M E cube C cube it was equal to N H bar cube by h bar to the 6 n n m e cube m p to the 6 and <coughs> g cube is this right Mm, this is nice. Mm. This may be the C cube. Mm. Mm. So we have C cube is equal to N by H bar cube. N squared by H bar, bar cube. Uh, G cube. Um, M P to the power six. Mm. And this determines the mass of this one. This may this has a chance of being the right. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, this is m squared is equal to h bar cube c cube by. Uh, oh. so we should be limiting 
Yeah, that's what it did. Yeah, well, then we should determine n and then uh, multiply mp uh, with. I'm just n times mp is okay. n. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 I'll just write the formula first, then, then you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, go on. Sorry, what, what was the question? What? This is a mass uh, above which the problem becomes non relativistic. The electrons become non relativistic. That's right, relativistic. And this is a mass above which the electrons become relativistic. It's interesting yeah. that the mass of the electron has dropped out of this problem. Okay? So now, uh, so now imagine that you in you you did the Chandrasekhar problem with an electron of twice the mass. Hmm? You'd get the same answer. So now, if you did it with an electron of the mass of order the proton, you'll get an answer of the same order of magnitude. Thank you very much. That was a very stupid mistake. So, uh, yeah, I, I think this is the right answer. Uh, of course, to see clearly that this is that this thing cannot be sustained, uh, and nothing being done clearly establishes the subject. Okay, to see it clearly requires a calculation. The calculation is actually not hard to do. Would you guys like an assignment on it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, okay, so let's let's. Okay, consider a star. Okay, sustained by degeneracy pressure. Let's let's look at a neutron star for simplicity. This is one kind of particle. So, in the Newtonian gravity or Einstein? Gravity? No, no, full Einstein. Full, full Einstein. Yeah. Okay. So, the star is described by the metric. D s squared is equal to a of r minus a of r dt squared plus dr squared divided by b of r hmm, plus r squared d omega squared. A of r, b of r, we don't yet know what a of r and b of r. Okay. Um, the the stress tensor will be of the usual form. So uh, the stress tensor will be of the usual form, which is, so first, uh, the effective velocity of the fluid okay, is in the dt direction. Okay, But it's not just 1 because of the say of r. u mu has to square to minus 1. Okay, So u mu. So th 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 uh, we have a fluid with u mu is equal to 1 by square root a of r, hmm? um, 1, 0, 0, 0. No, u lower mu will have. No, u square has to be. Has to be minus one. Hmm. Yeah. So, when you square this, we get rid of the one by square root a. That's how I wrote it. Hmm. Okay, so we have a flu uh, wh whose velocity is this, and the stress tensor of the fluid is t mu nu 
is equal to g mu nu plus u mu u nu mm. p of r plus u mu u nu e of r. It's the equation of state is the is this. So the uh, if the equation of state just comes from integrating this, yeah. <laughs> right? So we have um, so 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 basically what we're going to have now is two things. We will also have a <laughs> yeah, just just in terms of the number, right? So, um, so 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 where, where where were we? So we had n was equal to. Um, so the equation of state. So the the equation of state is obtained as follows. I'll just say it in words. You basically what you do is to find the energy density as a function of the number density. And you find the pre uh, <laughs> pressure as a function of the number density. And write everything if you want in terms of the number density. So that gives you an effective equation of state. It's the whole stress tensor in terms of one variable. It's what we've been doing, but if you do this, actually, you might want to do it with numbers. You might not want to throw away the four pi's and so on. Okay? Now, you plug this into Einstein's equation. Do you understand? Do you understand? So at any given point, at place, you've got a certain number density of, for, uh, of your fermions. Let's call them neutrons. Given the number density, that determines both the energy density and the pressure, just by doing this calculation. OK? Great. See, now, 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 now do that and so, uh, set up Einstein's equations. OK? You'll, you'll need three equations to solve for three variables. The variables will be A of R, B of R, and N of R. OK? And then the question will be to see under what circumstances. Uh, uh, and then you've got, you've got a certain inter uh, an integration constant, which is n of r integral over proper volume is equal to n. OK? It's like a chemical potential. So the, uh, the question will be to see. So The integration, uh, this integration? Yes. Yes. And, the const I mean, and this constant time slides, uh, which, and th there will be factors of uh, PR. Uh. Yeah, you would have to take the factor, exactly. You would have to take the factor of PR under account. Exactly. So you, you would have to take. So there is some implicit dependence between N and PR. Uh. Exactly. So the proper volume, hmm. so you, you, you calculate, given, you've got some pro, if you want, you can e also introduce a number density, a J mu which is a number current, OK? J mu will be n of r times u mu. This is now a proper density, OK? 
And the best way then to get the total number of electrons is to do J dot N over a spatial slice. It's the charge of this current. <laughs> okay? The conservation of this, however, uh, in this case, you know, the, the, the every, not this is only J0, and everything is time independent. Okay? So there will be essentially nothing. Uh, there will be, I don't think, anything in independent uh, coming from J0. You, you could think of it that way also. I don't think there will be anything independent. Okay? So set up this problem. Try to solve for the equation, uh, subject to the condition that there is this one uh, um, constraint. constraint. The total number of uh, total number of fermions a is a. Okay. So our job is to find this metric. Is to find the uh, to find the metric and to see uh, when it exists, when a static solution exists. At some point, you should find that the static solution does not exist. Okay, and you should find that that happens when the total mass. It is ordered. Yeah, when mass as you know the really precise thing is this n. When n, as defined by mass divided by. That will just be determined. Uh, this is some expansion. Uh, you, you should find a precise formula for n, uh, for capital N mm. for when there is no solution. And then you can express it however you want. This M here could be thought of as a mnemonic, uh, as a mnemonic for capital N times little. Okay. But uh, in the general relativity problem, there's nothing approximate. What you're doing here is just completely exact. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. I think that's good. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 th this I don't think is a very difficult problem. I don't think I've ever done it myself, but it sounds pretty straightforward. Uh, it would be a nice, thing, nice exercise to do. Good. Mm. It's the same kind of problem, by the way, if you wanted to set up the equilibrium of a relativistic star. Except then you would use a different equation of state, one that would be dictated by thermal energy. There you would solve not for N as a function of T, but for instance, effective temperature as a function of T. Okay? But one, if you've done one, you can do mm. the other one. Okay, I think this would be a nice problem. I, I think you should get this, this, this answer roughly. Now, assuming I've got this thing correct, uh, assuming that this stick is not just a hopeful thing, um, this thing, if you calculate it, turns out to be about 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Okay, and so that tells you that not only is this a theoretical restriction, it's a restriction that comes well within the bounds of astrophysical reality. Okay, so actual stars like that of our sun, or things a bit heavier than our sun, when they run out of fuel, uh, have the possibility of not having a stable endpoint. At least not due to degeneracy pressure. You know, what could it be? So firstly, these electron stars, electrons and protons, they can go into neutrons and st plus other stuff that, like neutrinos that go away. So this is just, just neutrons left. OK? And uh, uh, then you do a similar calculation as, as we discussed for, for the neutrons. In fact, you're doing this calculation here for the neutrons. That cannot balance. Mm. Maybe the fact that neutrons have some substructure can help. But you know, in the end, uh, at high enough energies, neutrons are made up almost free quarks. Free quark. You can do the same calculation for that. In the end, it will not help very much. You know, there will always be a point where nothing that we know of can sustain this pressure. OK? It's important here, by the way, that QCD is asymptotically free. So what it means is that when, when everything's moving very fast, at least the basic quarks are moving very fast, in the end, it's behaving like free, free particles. 
So a calculation which is assuming everything is free is not a ridiculous calculation. Okay. So um, what, what, what could this go to? Uh, well, looks like it collapsed without bound and will eventually head to making a Schwarzschild black hole. This was this great suggestion made by Chandrasekhar in the 1930s. Okay. And uh, it, it was at a time at which the Schwarzschild black hole solutions were not taken seriously by almost anyone. Yep, al almost anyone. Einstein himself you know, famously regarded the Schwarzschild solution as useful for describing the outside of stars, but a mathematical artifact for you know, the event horizon. So it's too weird. It could never be formed in any physical process. That was his view. And now we have not just a plausible physical process, but one that happens all the time in our universe. Stars run out of fuel. Huh? Okay. Uh, which looks plausibly like it's going to make uh, uh, a Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, so uh, 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 okay, so great. So the first, the, the, this suggests that Schwarzschild black holes, perhaps formed from the collapse, black holes formed from the collapse of stars. Okay, now you could ask, is there a way in which we can put some more, uh, you know, some more meat to this? Uh, some more mathematical meat to this idea. Can we describe the collapse of anything in a mathematically amenable way to form black holes? Yeah, that would make it more convincing that these weird solutions form starting from non-black hole type solutions. Uh, this question was addressed by in a really interesting and very, very early paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder. Uh, in 1939, this paper is called "On Gravitational Collapse." Okay, and I wanted to quickly go through go through this paper with, with you guys. Okay, so um, so the basic idea of this paper is, is the following. We've got this. The, the idea is, as we've seen, black holes we believe collapse when the pressure can no longer sustain, uh, can no longer sustain the gravitational pull. Okay. So then, if we want to look at um, a, a collapse situation, uh, to, uh, in order to study a situation where um, we've got some material that can no, no longer withstand the gravitational push, uh, probably. It's interesting to look at the other, the, the limit of a gas with just zero pressure. Such a gas is also amenable to, uh, to analytic analysis. Okay? So we're going to follow Oppenheimer Snyder and try to study the collapse of a ball of dust. Okay, so that's what we're going to do for the next. I'm sorry, this took much longer than I anticipated because of my incompetence. Uh, but uh, uh, so we may not. We probably won't finish this discussion today. We are continuing. Okay, so the uh, the idea is to uh, is you've got this ball of dust. We're going to make it spherically symmetric, and uh, as we will see as we go along in our solving. Uh, this ball of dust has uh, uh, an initial, you know, two free functions in it, which is the density of the dust and the initial velocities of the dust. Everything is radial. Okay, so there are two functions of R as initial conditions for this problem. As functions of these initial conditions, and uh, Oppenheimer Snyder actually focused on one very special um, initial condition, the collapse of homogeneous dust. So then they found a very beautiful solution. We, we, we're going to try to study that. Okay? So that's what we're going to try to do. Suppose we've got a cloud of dust. Mm, there's some 
profile of the dust, what the, uh, the, what the density of the dust is as a function of r. And there's another free function, which is the velocity field of the dust as a function of r. Uh, what we want to do is to, uh, is to study the, the, rel the dynamics of the system under general relativity. So that's a problem we set up. Okay. Now, what we expect, of course, is that this thing has no pressure. So there's no stationary solution. Now, of the whole idea of this lecture is that pressure sustains gravity. But dust has no pressure, so it cannot sustain. So clearly, it's going to collapse. So this solution now has two paths. There's a path outside the cloud of dust and the path inside the cloud of dust. OK? So wha uh, what, we uh, what, what most of what we want to do is to understand the space time in this in these interior region. But let's take five minutes to understand the exterior region. The exterior region is just going to be the Schwarzschild space time. However, how far the Schwarzschild space time is valid varies as a function of time. Because that's the position of the end point of this ball of dust. Now, imagine any one of these dust particles. Any one of these dust particles is just moving in a geodesic. OK? A geodesic in the metric. A geodesic in the metric. Uh, that we will eventually find, uh, solve for. So to understand the motion of the dust particle here, well, we don't know how to do it, okay? Because we don't yet know what the metric is. But what about the dust particle right at the edge? The dust particle right at the edge is moving in a geodesic in the metric that it sees, and it sees the Schwarzschild metric. So the dust particle right at the edge is moving in a geodesic in the Schwarzschild metric. So while actually solving for uh, finding the solution in detail is going to be complicated and we're going to have to do some work to do it, to find how this radius, how the end point of the, the path that is covered by dust varies is very simple. All we have to do is follow the radial geodesics. The time independent uh, metric, the form of the metric. Uh, in the Schwarzschild metric. In the Schwarzschild metric. And that, that metric is constant throughout the evolution of yes. the dust. And that so yeah, so the, the only thing that changes is the range over which it varies. Yeah. Okay, uh, also, uh, not, not even m changes. Where that Schwarzschild is valid. Yeah, so it's like the metric was going to be ds squared is equal to minus uh, 1 minus 2m by r dt squared plus dr squared over 1 minus 2m by r uh, plus dr squared, sorry, plus r squared d omega squared for r is greater than some r of t. <coughs> okay? The r of t is uh, the uh, Precise location of uh, the uh, particle on the edge of, of the uh, of the edge. Exactly, and so, in order to understand how this r of t behaves, that's exactly the same problem as understanding radial geodesics in um, in the Schwarzschild background. Now, luckily, we are all experts in this problem <laughs> because we studied it before. Okay. Radial geodesics in, in the Schwarzschild background, you guys can look up your notes. Uh, of course, it depends on the energy of the geodesic. Okay? But if we assume that the energy of the geodesic, that's the case of interest to us. Of course, we could take shells that are moving outside so fast that they're expanding rather than collapsing. You know, that they will go, that they're going past the escape velocity. But that's not of interest. Imagine that we have. That, for instance, we look at a solution where th at least the outermost shell is at some fixed distance r at time t equals 0 and is at rest. OK? So you, you've got your effective potential. You remember these effective potentials, right? So you've got the effective potential, the particle is at rest, and then it starts rolling. 
Now, we think we're talking about purely radial motion. No angular momentum barrier. It's go just going to go straight in. Okay? So, I'll leave it to you guys as an exercise to integrate that. So, exercise. This is the outermost test. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, find R of T. Find the proper time on this dust particle at which it goes through the horizon. And check in particular is finite. Okay? So this exercise which is very simple. It's just pulling back your notes, looking up this effective potential picture that we had, and solving for motion in this classical motion in this effective potential. We'll already uh, we'll already tell you that this thing is a going to collapse. That th that such a cloud of dust is going to collapse, and b that this collapse enters the Schwarzschild radius at finite proper time. If you were somebody living on this at the edge of this dust cloud, you would enter the Schwarzschild radius at finite proper time. Okay. Now we want to do more. We want to do more than understand what happens uh, just at the edge. We want to understand the formation of the black hole singularity. We want to understand um, the true event horizon of this collapsing space time. Uh, we want to understand many things about this geometry. Okay, and for that we have to sol uh, we have to solve uh, for the inside of the black hole. Okay, so I'll just start setting it up. We won't get too far today, but okay. Sorry. So I'll just start setting up the problem. I'll just get the formalism on, and then we'll actually try to solve it tomorrow. Uh, next, next. Okay. I, in order to study this problem, it's useful to move to co-moving coordinates. Okay. So to move to coordinates in which we're sitting on each of the dust particles. So let R be thought of as a label for individual dust particles. Okay? Individual. What? R is it label for individual shell dust particles? Individual what? Shell. Uh, uh, yes. I, 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 individual shells of dust particles. Yes. 
Um, yes. OK. Um, so this is very much like our discussion of cosmology, Okay, where, where we label points in space by galaxies. Here we're labeling points in space by, by dust particles. And let tau be the proper time for any given dust particle. OK, so what, what does the metric look like? We have ds squared is equal to minus d tau, the whole thing squared. Okay, uh, ds squared is equal to minus d tau the whole thing squared plus um, the notation e to the power 2 e to the power omega bar dr squared minus e to the power omega okay let's just call this a and b at speed we'll switch to the notation when we're actually going to solve just to understand it this a and b are at the moment arbitrary functions of both tau and capital R. Okay, so a is equal to a. Of Why is there a minus uh, before uh, this? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, in this setup, this is our metric. Now, in this setup, we've got a, you know, we're not solving Einstein's equations in vacuum, we're solving it with a stress tensor. But the stress tensor is what we've discussed before, right? The stress tensor in this case, it's just that for dust. So as in cosmology, T mu nu is equal to U mu, U nu. Epsilon. So this epsilon once again, sorry? No, P is zero. P is zero, zero exactly. Uh, where epsilon once again is a function of R and tau. This dust density could be a function of where you are as well as when you are. Okay? And u mu in this case is just minus one zero zero zero. Or u, u mu up is one zero zero zero. Okay? So basically, what we have is T tau tau is equal to epsilon of R and tau. Okay, and everything else is zero. Okay, so very much like in cosmology, what we're going to do is to set up the equations of motion for this situation. The only difference from cosmology, really in the in the form of in the uh, in the sense of setting up, well, um, well, there are two two differences in cos from cosmology. Firstly, from cos in cosmology, we assume that everything was homogeneous and isotropic. So we had not just this s s two here, but this whole space was either yeah, S3, H3, or R3 with something overall outside. Okay, what we are allowing for is two functions here. So we are preserving less symmetry. We are not preserving this. We are just preserving rotational invariance. Okay. Secondly, and this is related, homogeneity, of course, uh, homogeneity and isotropy, of course, meant that nothing was a function of R. In cosmology, everything was a function of tau. Here our functions, our unknown functions, are functions of R and tau. So there are two differences from cosmology. A, we've got two functions. And B, the more serious difference, is that uh, these two functions are now functions of two variables rather than one variable. Okay? So this problem might therefore seem like a much more difficult problem than cosmology, especially the two variables. The difference between an ordinary differential equation and a partial differential equation is often a very big difference. 
<laughs> Nonetheless, quite incredibly, we can actually in exactly solve this problem. Okay, I'll go through this exact solution with you guys, but let's just start that. Next. 